Hi, and welcome to Vetsplanation. I'm your veterinary host, Dr. Sugarman, and I'm going to teach you about veterinary medicine. In this podcast, we can dive deeper into the understanding of what our pets are going through and break down medical terms into easier to understand chunks of information. Just a quick disclaimer, this podcast is for informational purposes only. This is not meant to be a diagnosis for your pet. If you have questions about diagnostics or treatment options, please talk to your veterinarian about those things. Remember, we are all practicing veterinary medicine and medicine is not an exact science. Your veterinarian may have different treatment options and different opinions. The information I provide here is to help pet parents have a better understanding about their pets. If you like our podcast, please consider sharing this podcast with at least one friend or just somebody else who has pets as well. Now, let's jump into this week's episode. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Dr. Sugarman. Thank you for joining us on Vetsplanation again. I'm here again with Dr. Z. Now, thank you again so much for coming on. We really enjoyed your presentation Yay. this last week. So, so glad. <laughs> yeah. So I'm excited to hear more about like ticks now as well. Yes, ticks. Let's do it. Yes. All Another right. fascinating parasite. Yes, yes. And so many of them. All right. So what what is a tick? Great. So I would go through the classification of ticks. They are considered arachnids or arthropods. Um, they have jointed legs, just like spiders and mites. They're, they're also in that classification. So they're not an insect. They're actually more like a spider. <laughs> there are hard ticks, which is mostly what we're talking about. They're in the classification Ixodidae, I-X-O. And then there's soft ticks as well, which I was interested to learn a little bit about when I was researching this. They're in the family Argus Argacidae, if I say it. Um, Close enough. Yeah. I, I don't know if that's correct. So you're, you're, I'm Great. sure you're good. Sounds <laughs> good. <laughs> soft ticks, I don't know much about. We're, they're parasitic for our cats and dogs right. and people. Although I, I did hear about some diseases that people can get from soft oh, ticks, but we're not going to go into it. Okay. We're just talking about the hard one. Ticks, like fleas, are very old, ancient creatures. They, around 100 million years old, seems to be upon. They've also been found in fossils and in on the mammoths. Not on the mammoths. Uh, I didn't yeah. read about that. That was fleas. <laughs> Maybe they are, though. I just okay. have to look it up. But they saw them in the amber, just like the fleas. Yeah. And, and so amber has trapped ticks and other insects. And they've been dated all the way back to the Cretaceous period. So wow. about 100 million years or so. They are also parasitic and blood feeding. They can't live without hosts. And it's interesting because let's talk about their life cycle. Yeah. They have to have a blood meal on every stage of their life cycle before they can move on to the oh, next life stage. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So they start out an egg and then the, the larva hatches out. And unlike insects where it looks like a worm, mm -hmm. their larva looks immediately like a tick, like it's a, yeah. a miniature Yeah, <laughs> tick. just a baby. Baby, yeah. baby. Very tiny. Um, okay. Like the size of a poppy seed or smaller. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> and poppy seeds are black, but sometimes these baby larva ticks are like light gray, tan, really hard to see. Yeah. And they interestingly have only six legs, like when they're larva, just like an insect, which has six legs. But then when they molt into their nymph stage, they, they get the eight legs. Okay. Like a like spider. Or just become, just get two more legs. Yeah. They're yeah. like, let's get two more. Why not? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> So it goes egg, larva with six legs, and then nymph, eighth legs, and then adult. So they have one more molt into an adult, okay. which also has eight legs. So if you're curious, you could count and see if they have nymph or, an, or, or a larva. But I don't think you'll be able to see the larva anyway. Right, They're right. so tiny. And sometimes they have only one host that they always feed on in every cycle. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, it's two or even three different hosts that they're eating during these life stages. And the life cycle can last anywhere from two to three years, depending on the species of tick. But each stage of life, they they can survive for extended periods, like if conditions are right. Sometimes yeah. for months to years, they can just stay in that nymph stage or stay in that larval stage. So it could be many years before an individual tick goes through its life cycle. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. If all goes well, it's two to three day years and then they die. But yeah. So it can Still be much longer. Long they can live a long time. Yeah. Eight to 10 years. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. And again, each life stage needs a blood meal. So that tiny little larva with six legs has to eat a blood meal before it can turn into a nymph. And then once they are an adult, they, they breed. And the female, very interestingly, has to get engorged with blood. It's called feeding to repletion. It's uh -huh. gross. 
Yeah. But once they can't drink any more blood, they get huge. They get, I don't know. Oh, they times. get gigantic, yeah. Yeah, like a half inch long maybe by the time yeah. they are too full to eat anymore. And then that's when they finally drop off the host and they lay eggs, the females do. For like the brown dog tick, for example, will lay 4,000 to 6,000, 7,000 eggs. At a time? Yeah, Gosh. she just, her whole body just explodes with her eggs. Wow. <laughs> and then they <laughs> die, like the females die mm. after that. That's the end Got it. of the, the life cycle. Yeah. yeah. But the soft ticks, interestingly, they don't die after they lay eggs. They can have four or five batches go through it all again, eat again, and lay eggs again. For oh my goodness. yeah, they keep going. Well, luckily, they don't. We don't have to deal with them too much. Thankfully, but... yes. <laughs> <laughs> their anatomy is cool. Their heads and their chest and their abdomen are all fused together, unlike other arachnids. There's just one big lump. And then they just have these big legs that come out, and each leg has seven segments. <laughs> so there are lots of little joints. And at the very end, they have these claws that are like sensors. They're crazy sensors. They sense yeah. all kinds of things just on the front ones. And they detect temperature and like air current changes. They can smell like odors and stuff. And they can detect carbon dioxide, just like fleas. Vibrations, they can feel that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Moisture, they can detect if it's wet or not. Humidity. Wow. And they can even see light through these little sensors on their legs. That's crazy. Pretty, Imagine like pretty your cool. fingers, just one finger being able to do that. Yeah, yeah. It's like on the tip of our finger would be an eyeball, an ear, a nose, yes. and a mouth. <laughs> and a CO2 sensor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Plus. Yeah. <laughs> so they're pretty cool little mm. buggers. And they do what's called questing behavior, which is really fun to talk about. That's the adults or the like, nymph larva adults. They all try and quest to find their their host. So they crawl up onto a blade of grass or a leaf or something and they hold onto the tip of it with their back legs, like two or three pairs of their back legs. And then their front legs are have the sensors, right? And they're just waving above their heads, just waving around. (laughs) And then uh, like if somebody brushes by, they start waving like frantically. There's videos of it. And then as soon as something brushes by, they stick on real fast. And then they're super fast. And they, like, crawl right onto the the body of the... (laughs) Who volunteered for that? I'm going to walk next to this. There's a video of a finger, Uh, like, the the tick questing and then the finger. And as soon as the finger gets close, it's frantically waving. And then then, then it catches the finger and crawls onto the finger. It's probably on YouTube. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm going to have to look this up now. Yep. Yeah. So once they're on... They wander up until they find their favorite place on the body. They somehow know where to go. Brown dog ticks, for example, they really like the ears of the dogs. It's safe in there. It's dark. Inside the ear, not on the outside. Inside the ear. Yeah, the inner flap. Not down in the ear canal, but like on the inside skin of the ear. Yeah. And so there's pictures of dogs with a bunch of dog ticks and you open their ear and it's just covered with bodies of fat female dog ticks. (laughs) Super gross. Yep. And so once they feed, they cut the skin and then they spit out. They have really crazy saliva with all kinds of properties. And the the saliva has got a numbing agent in it. So you can't really feel that they bit you. And then they have this crazy feeding tube that comes out of their face. (laughs) It's just it's like a tube that shoves up into the hole that they cut. And it's got barbs on it. Some species have barbs on them that are backwards, like an arrowhead. So they'll stick in there. And then they spit out a cement, like a glue, to solidify and stick it on there so it's not going anywhere. And then they spit out like a blood thinner, too. And Uh so it keeps the blood from clotting under where they've attached. And so it just keeps flowing so they can keep sucking it up. And some ticks are quick about doing all of that, like 10 minutes. But other ones, it takes them like a couple hours to get all set up yeah, and, yeah. and stuff and blood thinning and all of that. But once they're on there, they that's their main goal is to just suck, suck, suck. Ticks will suck blood for several days. And that's actually when the pathogens are ingested by the host. If the host has some sort of bacteria, the tick will suck it up in one life stage and then carry it to the next host and give it to them on the next Mm, life stage so yeah it's when they're hooked up and sucking blood for those days that those pathogens are moved back and forth yeah 
Um, most of the time, luckily, they have to be feeding for at least 24 hours for that pathogen to be transmitted. Okay. So if we can kill them before, before that, yeah. then we don't usually get the nasty diseases that they can right. give us. After their feeding is complete, like we talked about before, the, the big, fat, bloody females will drop off finally and then lay their eggs. Or if it was a nymph stage, they will molt mm. into the adult or the right. larva will molt into the nymph and going. Yeah. Yeah. I have lots of more fun facts. Yes, I want to hear about these fun facts. I was reading some of them. And... Ticks are hardy. They're hard to kill in general. Um, they they have been shown to survive the washing machine. If you have a tick on your clothes and you're like, eh, I'll just throw it in the washer. Yeah. They live through that, oh even the hot cycle. Yeah. They can live in a vacuum. Somebody studied this, like with no air for, for half an hour before they die. They don't have to breathe for half an hour. Wow. So they could be out in space for a bit, too. Yeah. Yeah. Space ticks. They don't need a helmet. They can live in drought, uh, desert areas without feeding for four to nine months. And um, they have, I was talking about all the cool things they have in their spit. Yeah. There's another cool thing. They can secrete like a special saliva that attracts fluid out of the air. I don't know how that works, oh. but it, it like it brings water to them, yeah. uh, aerosolized, and then they can drink and survive for four, four to nine that's crazy. So the dry doesn't That's really crazy. bug them too much. They can live in freezing zero degrees for two hours before they freeze to death. And then they can live in 20 degrees. So just like a really cold winter yeah. for two weeks before dying. They've been found in Antarctica and they feed on penguins. Kev? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. They, they feed on the penguins there. There's a penguin tick <laughs> in Antarctica. I had no idea. Yeah. I didn't either. It's fun. <laughs> But usually they feed on mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians. I wasn't aware that they fed on the, the reptiles and amphibians, but they do. And then if you find a tick on your dog or cat, you can send them into Oklahoma State University if you're interested. Just go to showmeyourticks.com. That's <laughs> T-I-C-K-S. <laughs> mm-hmm. Or, and that I think... Com- we'll switch you over to showusyourticks.org, which is the real website, but either one will work. They have a submission form and you can fill it out. You do have to submit the tick in like a plastic container that will yeah. close and then a plastic bag and with the form. And they're just trying to do research and figure out how many types of ticks are throughout the U.S. Yeah, you know, where they're found. Where they're found, what kind, yeah. mm-hmm. and just help document that. Because how many ticks go un- undiagnosed or like unidentified? <laughs> so it's just a way to help figure out ticks if you yeah. want to if you're interested and you pull a tick off your dog send it in <laughs> nice nice i love the website so i know you've talked so far about the brown dog tick what other mm. types of ticks are there yes there's so many types i think just for to make things easy for us let's just focus on the ones that we see here yes. in our neck of the woods of the northwest so the one of the big ones that we worry about but is the actually the western black-legged tick which is Ixodes pacificus. It's different than the Ixodes scapularis, which is over on the East Coast. But we have our very own Ixodes. And oh, aren't we lucky? Yes. Yeah. It's here and now. <laughs> it's It's been documented even here, right here in our hometown, Pierce County. There was an wow. established infection or population determined by the CDC. And they are active in the cold months. Just like I was saying, they, these are the ones that can survive in freezing temperatures and it doesn't freeze here very often as soon as it thaws they're out and about again yeah (laughs) these ones carry lyme disease and anaplasma that's why we see those diseases here there's also the dermacenter tick or the rocky mountain wood tick but that's on the eastern washington and oregon area so over the mountain where it's drier yeah so if you go to leavenworth or right washington state okay yeah yeah then you need to be worrying about those types of ticks. Yeah. They spread Rocky Mountain spotted fever, tularemia, and Colorado tick fever. Just oh, I didn't in case you're wondering. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Although we don't see it very often here. I think yeah. those types of ticks actually span all along the, the Rocky Mountains. Yeah. So which kind of start in New Mexico and go all the way up to Canada. They have a long <laughs> path of, <Right. laughs> of in being <laughs> infecting people, but it seems like we don't see those diseases too much, but they're that's what they can carry. Okay. And then the brown dog tick, like I was talking about earlier, they're they're everywhere in the U.S. They're quite an amazing tick. They they're one of the few ones that are able to live happily inside home. 
most of the other ones are outdoors and they can't like they don't like being in the house but brown dog ticks will set up in a wall or whatever and inside the wall yeah pictures yeah <laughs> um and they're all over the u.s um their big disease that they spread is rocky mountain spotted fever um, but that's mostly in the southern u.s okay and so they don't seem yes. to spread it as much to us thankfully oh good <laughs> she said brown dog chick prefers to be in the house then yes i would say it's happy anywhere okay. but they're like one of the only ones that can infest a house yeah like cockroaches like yeah they can get inside the walls and be inside the other ones don't typically do that they're more outside where do you normally find them like around tree areas bushes like what good do they question prefer? yes along trails would be the biggest common area to find them but there's always ex exceptions <laughs> So the young life stages are usually on the small mammal hosts, like um, those little larvas, they're tiny. And so they, they catch on to like rodents, mice and stuff, and they're lower to the ground. Lizards and birds sometimes are down and that's where uh, they can yeah, yeah. catch those guys. So anywhere there's a lot of that kind of wildlife, especially the rodents, there can be more ticks around. As the ticks get bigger, they seek larger hosts like deer, raccoons, possums. There's cattle, too. There's one tick that really likes livestock that came over from uh, Asia. It's called the Asian longhorned tick. And it's I just have to talk about it real quick because yeah. it's so scary. <laughs> Even though we don't have it here, um, this tick is really fast. It runs really fast. And it really just um, is fascinating because it doesn't have to mate to lay eggs. So it uh -huh. can reproduce asexually. Yeah. And so it's spreading really fast and they're finding it in it on livestock all over the East Coast right now. I think maybe it'll work its way over here. I'm sure, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but neighborhoods that have a lot of deer or, or houses that are up against a forest, which is we're always moving into cutting down trees and then putting houses there, that's probably going to be more ticky area than Got like it. really urban places. But they're in raccoons, they're in cities, they're everywhere and they can carry ticks and fleas and bring them to us. So. so do we find them more in the city or more in like the rural areas? I would say more rural. Yeah. Other than the brown dog ticks, which can get into a house, but neighborhoods that are up against the forests. And I would say if you're going on hikes a lot with your dogs, mm -hmm. that's where there's a lot of deer and wildlife. That's probably more where you're going to find ticks. Okay. Yeah. And are ticks harmful then? Oh, yes. Yeah. They spread disease, <laughs> which I've alluded to already. That's the main concern besides sucking our blood, which is icky and gross and being secretive about it. Mm -hmm. Like they'll get in your armpit or something and you don't see Weird it for faces. a day. Yeah, yeah exactly. The, the back of your knee or something. Yeah. And some some really like your head, so they'll get up under your hair. Yeah. <laughs> nope. It's going to shave my head now. That's what's yeah. going to happen. <laughs> so I think that is harmful. It's mentally harmful for me. <laughs> But they also spread disease, <laughs> not just to people, but to dogs. And sometimes cats will even get sick with tick-borne diseases. Um, in our area, the big one is Lyme disease, Rocky Mountain spotted fever to some extent, and rare cases of tularemia, just based on the ticks that we see here. Those are the diseases they can carry. But there's other ones you've probably heard of, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, um, the Biziosis. There's rare ones too, like Heartland bourbon virus. Um, I've never heard. I had neither, yeah. but it's on the CDC website. Okay. The CDC, by the way, is a wonderful resource yeah. for all all things tick. You can see maps and learn about their life cycle more and all of it nice. there. So just go to their website. It's really great. I have to name a couple other diseases, though, that they can spread. Colorado tick fever is one. Powassan virus. Wow. Rickettsiosis. And there's simply hard tick relapsing fever. Tick-borne relapsing fever seems pretty generic names, yeah. but they're yeah. actually diseases we have figured out are tick-borne. All of these diseases, they have the same sort of symptoms, plus or minus. Fever is a big one. Rashes, maybe. The Rocky Mountain spotted fever is really big on the rash, like all over nasty rash, and it can get complicated and need amputations in some oh really severe cases. Yeah. Low platelets is a big one that we'll see on our dogs, especially. Platelets help us clot our blood, for those that don't know. So if we don't have enough platelets, then we can just spontaneously start bleeding and hemorrhaging right. into any area of our body. <laughs> yes. And it's life-threatening, you can imagine. Right. We don't have enough platelets. So that's one of the big things that brings dogs here on emergency, I think. Um, if that goes untreated, there can be more chronic problems too, like 
arthritis issues, heart issues. There's even reports of uveitis in the eyes and inflammation behind the eyes and, and CNS or central nervous system problems, seizures and respiratory failure. It's a, a wide gambit of problems from these nasty pathogens. Yeah. Some kids, if they get get it real bad, they can get meningoencephalitis too and seizures and death from that. So yeah. It can also tr eventually trigger DIC or disseminated intra Vascular, yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> or death is coming. Yeah, that's what we call it. Death is coming. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Have you done an episode? I haven't on done that, that one yet. Oh, okay. I keep saying I'm going to do it. It's just so extensive, but yeah. it's on the list. It's okay. on the list of ones to do. If yes. you do, you have to mention that ticks can cause yes, it. I will do that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's bad. Yeah, it can be really bad. Thankfully, though, these are usually treatable with antibiotics, and if it's treated early, then all of these, they can get better. We can recover nice. from these things. Um, it's when you, you don't treat early that we run into all these horrible problems or delayed onset issues. Like, like in people, they'll get with Lyme disease, they can end up with um, heart problems, chronic arthritic problems, nerve issues, uh, fatigue, relapsing joint pain, it just goes on and on. Oh, it also can end up getting in the kidneys and cause nephritis and inflamed oh, wow. kidney and they can end up with chronic kidney disease too. Yeah. And sometimes that happens in, in dogs when we're when they're not treated. So that's crazy. I don't think I've ever yeah. looked for Lyme disease in a dog kidney player. That's yep. a good thing to look for next time. I think it's just so generally rare, rare. here that right. we're not really maybe we're missing it because we're not looking for it. Sure. Yeah. I don't that. So then you mentioned with Lyme disease and stuff, and I mentioned a little bit, do we have ways of testing for these diseases? Uh, yes, very good blood tests. Thankfully, we have really good blood tests now that are called PCR or polymerase chain reaction, I believe. It's some fancy lab test yeah. <laughs> that can actually <laughs> look for the pathogens, like what we call the antigen or parts yeah. of the pathogen that we can identify, like the actual presence of that pathogen. Sometimes they detect only the antibody, which is the body's immune reaction to it. We can see if they've actually been exposed or have an immunity to it. Not quite as helpful, in my opinion, as the antigen test, because mm -hmm. that tells me it's actually there versus, oh, they did have it at one point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's lots of blood tests for that. Um, the 40X we have in-house, we run it quickly. It looks for, I think, Ehrlichia, Lyme. Anaplasma. Anaplasma and heartworms, heartworms. in there too. Yeah. 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 But yeah, those are actually antibodies. So if we're really wondering, there is like these giant tick panels that we can send yeah. out to the lab and they look for all of them. Like not all of them, but most a of good, them. A good majority yeah, of them. Yeah, many of them. Yeah. There's always a chance that there's new ones out there we just don't know because a lot of animals come in, they get sick and they test negative for everything, but they have all the same symptoms. And I'm like, maybe it's a new tick-borne disease or some other problem yeah, that just we never just know. don't know to test for. We don't know what it is. Right. So... But yeah, it can be helpful. I think if there's a history of a tick bite too, then we can presume like if they have low platelets and a history of a tick bite, oh yeah, right. let's give them doxycycline. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which and brings us to the next question. Yes, Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So then that's pretty much what we do. So what are your treatments if they do come up as being positive? For yeah. So antibiotics, the big one is doxycycline is mm -hmm. thankfully very effective against pretty much all of these tick-borne diseases. Um, sometimes they just need it a couple of weeks, sometimes like a whole month of it. Amoxicillin can also work and is sometimes indicated, but it seems like doxycycline is the yeah. better go-to for it. Which you'll pretty much see with any of our dogs that have low platelets. We essentially put all of them on doxycycline since we can't be for sure. You know, we don't know 100% yep. for sure that they have a tick-borne disease or not. I think it's wise to do that because, again, if you don't treat it early, um, there can be really bad right. complications if you leave it there. Yeah, exactly. So better to be safe, I think, and just go ahead and treat if, they, if you have a suspicion. Right. Um, if they're really sick, like they come to you on ER and they're bleeding out, they might need blood transfusions to help cope with the platelets being too low. And then if they can be very painful, like Lyme disease, especially if it causes right. that, it's like almost like an autoimmune reaction in their joints. They have really swollen joints too. You can actually see swelling on their knees and their elbows and things. It's painful. Give them pain yeah. meds, anti-inflammatories. Right. It helps them get through it as, as you treat. But once you treat antibiotic and the pathogen goes down, usually that is reversible and Nice. They don't hopefully have too much lasting effect yeah. from it. Now we kind of like talked about the treatment stuff. How do we prevent ticks? Great. Um, well, first, like if you see a tick, uh, remove it as quick as possible. Yeah. Like don't just let it sit there. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's all kinds of fancy tools for tick removals, but 
you can just do it with tweezers. You don't need anything mm. fancy. You just want to try and grab as close as you can to the skin and just slowly and gradually pull it out. Constant pressure. No twisting. No twisting. No twisting. Just straight pull. Yep. Steady pull. Um, otherwise, if you like twist it or break it off too quick, the mouth parts can get stuck in mm. the skin, which isn't great. And it happens most of the time anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if you can't dig it out, just leave it. It'll work its way out with yeah. time. Yeah. There are some that they've shown that has caused an anaphylaxis once they've done that. Oh, really? Yeah. Hey. It's a pretty rare thing, but they have shown that the head breaks off. And it'll cause some dogs to go into anaphylaxis. Hopefully you don't break it off. That's what we just have to hope every time we do it. <laughs> yeah. So. There's like old wives tales of like you can try and put a match on it and heat mm -hmm. it and then it'll release, but you're probably just not. Burn the dog. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't work because they're like cemented in there. They're not just going to be like, oh, I'm going to let go. Yeah. Yeah. Nope, you got to pull them out. Right. Keep your yard groomed to uh, prevent the leaf litter and the tall grass, which is where they like to quest, right? Mm -hmm. And wait around for people to walk by or pets to walk by. So mow your lawn frequently, trim your bushes. If you have a lot of yard debris, you want to pick that up. You don't want to leave trash around. <laughs> Not that you do that anyway, but like if you have a, a wood pile for your wood stove or whatever, keep it neat, keep it dry, yeah. cover it so it doesn't get wet in there. That's where ticks like to live and hide out. Keep a border between the woods and your home. If you do live up next to a forest, kind of make a border between the fence and your house mm -hmm. so that they're less likely to get on the fence and into your yard, that yeah. kind of thing. If you can... Reduce the amount of rodents around is always a good thing, too. I have chickens. <laughs> yeah. And I actually had a rat problem with the chickens because they... It's very common. Yeah, they dig under. No matter how deep you put that fencing, they'll yeah. go under it and get into your coop. So the only way I found to get rid of them was to extend the hardware cloth that I... Mm -hmm. Don't use chicken wire. It's too big. The holes are too right. big. Mice get through that, no problem. But hardware cloth has maybe one centimeter holes. Right. They can't get through that. It's a lot harder to work with, but it's worth it. <laughs> and then I extended it all the way underground. So it's almost like a giant cage. Yeah. That the, and then I put dirt on top of that. So it's like a foot and a half below the dirt. Nice. It's a hardware cloth. So the mice can't get in anymore. Yeah. And that finally took care of the problem. So. But if you can keep rodents down, you're going to keep all these parasites down. They carry fleas too, as we talked about right. last time. So Sorry. fleas and ticks will be less likely to be in your area if you keep those kind of pests away. Nice. And then, of course, you want to put parasite preventatives on yes. your pets. Probably yes. the easiest thing and right. the most important thing, I think. We talked about the isoxazolines mm. last time. So Brevecto, Semperica, Cordelio, Nexgard, those are all great options. They kill fleas quickly. There's also over-the-counter and topicals as well, like Frontline and Advantage and the Ceresto Collar. They yeah. work pretty well. To, they don't kill them as quick, but they can help with killing and preventing tick bites. There's also a Lyme vaccine available. We don't have it here in our hospital just because we don't see Lyme disease that much. But like on the East Coast, it's it's available. It's got like variable efficacy, a little controversy over it, mm -hmm. but it does seem like it overall helps. And so if you're in an endemic area, if I lived over there, I would I would probably get that vaccine for yeah. my pets. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Yeah. It doesn't replace, though, the year round tick control. I right. think that that's probably going to work better. Um, and one side note I wrote here, Lyme disease can't be transmitted from a dog to the owner. If your dog is positive for Lyme disease, you're right. not going to get it from your dog. Yeah. You have to be bit by the tick to right. get it. Just okay. To make that clear for people yeah. so you don't worry about it. Exactly. Because <laughs> definitely people will worry about that, like yeah. how it's transmitted and stuff. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's great to clarify that. Yeah. So can you elaborate a little bit more on the like control products, like over-the-counter stuff versus our prescription type? Yeah. Yeah. I said it a little bit fast there, but... Um, in general, ticks are harder to kill than fleas. So the isoxazolines um, do work, but not as amazing as they do on, on fleas. They will kill them, though, generally 24 hours after they bite, before 24 hours is okay. up. Hopefully they're not transmitting any pathogens. Mm -hmm. These are all prescription only. So Sempericotria, which is my favorite one, covers fleas, ticks, and worms all in one. NextGuard Plus does pretty much the same thing. There's Cordelio and Brevecto, and those are my favorite options for, for dogs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for cats, Brevecto Plus is my favorite because it does fleas and ticks and worms too, and it lasts longer. It lasts nice. for two months, so we don't have to remember to put it on as often. Um, Revolution Plus is another great option for cats, but it only lasts for one month. 
Right. And there's a new one called Next Guard Combo that just came out mm. for cats that also kills tapeworms, which is nice. Nice. Yes, it's always good. <laughs> that one also has a nice oxazoline in it and will, will kill ticks quickly. The over-the-counter ones, so again, Advantage, Frontline, they work pretty well. They just take a little bit longer. So the Advantage just kills fleas. Don't you have to get Advantage ticks to kill them? Yes. Good. Yeah. yeah, so there is Advantage ticks too, I think they call it, mm. for dogs, and it has like an added... Well, imidacloprid will kill ticks to some extent, right? Yeah. But they add to it a, a pyrethrin, I want to say flu, flumethrin or something. Something like that, yeah. Which is actually one of the lesser toxic ones to cats. So it's like in the Soresto collar for cats as well. Okay. Um, so it's more of the natural pyrethrin, whereas the permethrins are the synthetic ones that last longer and work better, actually, but right. they're super toxic to cats. So that's hard to keep track. Pyrethrin versus permethrin, people don't really yes. know the difference. Yeah. All you need to do is just look at the label and right. see if it's okay for your cat. It'll be all over, like yes. literally in eight different places. Just say no dogs cats. only. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> And then check the weight, too, because some people like, ignore that and, and just put, like, the big dog dose on their small dog, small dog in it, or, or most horribly on us cats. Yes. <laughs> so I see the most often, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Or they'll try to split it between the different pets. And, right. Oh, just a little bit. It's not going to hurt my cat, but it does. Right. So you yeah. always put on what's labeled. It's going to be safer for yeah. your cat. Yeah. And it, it can help with flea and tick control, but they're just in my opinion, falling out of favor. <laughs> they're yeah. not working as well. They don't kill right. these bugs as quickly. Yes. And then they're more likely to transmit diseases. So in, in a nutshell, I recommend year-round parasite prevention and choosing one that has a nice oxazoline in it is going to be your best bet. Okay. And yeah. then first, besides the Soresto collar, so yeah. I'm going to talk about that. So flea collars in general. Yeah. I only recommend the Soresto if you're going to okay. do anything because it, it does actually work and it's safe. And um, the other ones, they don't have a metacloprid in it, which is what's in this resto collar and in Advantage and works. They have probably some other pyrethrin or pyrethroid in it that can be toxic to cats and probably won't kill the fleas or the ticks quickly enough. Yeah. Like they will kill them eventually, but it takes a week or something for them right. to die. And then they've had all Pretty kinds of chance yeah, yeah. To, yeah. to feed and to eat and to lay eggs. Right. And produce and so it's just not worth your money and it could be toxic like i said in the last one if i see a pet come in with a store-bought non-soresto flea collar i take it off and i throw it in the trash yeah like, it doesn't <laughs> in the work. room work, it's hurt can be harmful yeah so just stop okay. yeah and then do you recommend doing year-round tick control just like we did for flea control as well yeah absolutely just like we talked about the uh, ixodes pacificus tick is active in the winter months here yeah yes so okay. it's a risk year-round if you don't want these diseases, you should prevent it year-round. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there are not many things that make me squirm, but ticks do. Yeah. 100%. Me too. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and maggot. I I'm, not, I'm even okay with maggots. Really? Yeah. Uh, okay with I maggots. can't do maggot. Yeah, it's the ticks. <laughs> no, can't do it. I had one time I had to do x-rays on a deer as oh. a technician. Oh, yeah. And I had its head up by my head and I just saw the whole the whole thing just covered in ticks. Yeah, you. I thought I was going to vomit. Yeah, I, thought, I would have a hard time yeah, with that as well. I would yeah. be like, no, I'm not touching it. Well, I didn't know until like I had it up next to me. and Oh, it was terrible, yeah. terrible. One thing, it would be good to know that that tick probably is not going to let go and get on it's you. It's true. Yeah. But still just like knowing they were next to me. Yeah. yeah. It's gross. Yep. They're super gross. Yep. I remember visiting my family over on the East Coast and... I was on the back porch and there was, I noticed I was holding my baby girl. She was only like six months old at the time. And I noticed there was a couple of little ticks like running on her arm and I just brushed them off. But I was like yeah. freaking out the whole rest of the day. Right. <laughs> like it was questing, obviously, and yes. it just got on her. Yes. And she didn't get bit. But That's I was good. like, God, the, they're yeah. here. I hate them. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Creepy. Creepy for sure. Yes. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to ask my question for you now. All right. All right, so what is your favorite podcast and why? Oh. You don't okay. have to pick this one. I was I'm just saying. Say, do I have to say <laughs> no, that? No, 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 no. I really like that explanation, though. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. But yeah. It's going to be the, this podcast will kill you. Yeah, that's your favorite one? Yeah, okay. my favorite for sure. I, I don't know if I've listened to all of them, but it's pretty much my go-to. Yeah. I have, I have a whole bunch that I like, though. I know. I know you love podcasts. Yeah. Much, so I was wondering <laughs> which one was your favorite one. So. Yeah, that comes to mind as number one. Nice. I, think. I love nice. it. It's yeah. a great show. <laughs> awesome. They do a great job. <laughs> All right. Thank you again, Dr. Z. Again, I'm so happy that you came on to talk about ticks because yeah. I don't know very much about ticks. So I was very happy to hear, actually learn all this information. So. You're very welcome. Happy to share. And 
I hope I sent a good message to everyone to yes. keep up the parasite prevention. Parasite prevention, fleas and ticks, <laughs> for sure, year round. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> Good job. All right. Thank you, everybody. Again, um, as always, please keep your pets happy, healthy, and safe. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you guys for listening this week. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or you just want to say hi, you can email me at shugs, S-U-G-G-S, at vetsplanationpodcast.com, or visit the website at vetsplanationpodcast.com, or find us on Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok at Vetsplanation. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you back here next week.